Okay, she says we're on now. Uh, <laughs> we're obviously it's still in our trailer. Arrow's going to be the Sabbath School Kitty today, at least as long as she'll stay. Uh, Flash, our usual Sabbath School Kitty, is uh, back on the bunk back there. This is going to be the second time we've done this today. Mm -hmm. And next to the last one. Next week will be the last Sabbath School we're going to record. Until we're settled in sure Minnesota. <clears throat> As of right now, we don't have a definite move out date, but it's going to have to happen soon. Uh, this week, summer, this next week, Summer and I are going to Minnesota to look for a place to live. So hopefully that will happen quickly. And it looks like an arrow is going to be comforted while we're here. Anyway, <clears throat> let's start with our prayer. Father, we thank you for this Sabbath school that you let us have. We thank you that you have been so patient with us and have taken care of us. Please send your Holy Spirit to be part of the Sabbath school today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> she was going to do the mission story. It's going to be taking place in Bolivia. We're in South America, new quarter and all that. Uh, let me see if I can get this close enough so they can see this. Um, are you able to see it now? Bolivia is right here. So here's South America, Brazil, Peru, and Bolivia. So Bolivia is where this story takes place. <coughs> okay, four-year-old. Sebastian looked up at Mother and Father at the table. Let's pray, he said. Mother and Father looked at each other in surprise. They believed in God, but they had never prayed before eating. Let's thank God, Sebastian said. Mother bowed her head, closed her eyes. Father bowed his head, closed his eyes. Little Sebastian bowed his head, closed his eyes. And Mother thanked God for the food. After breakfast, Sebastian went to his school in Clisa. Bolivia. Sebastian had started studying the Seventh Day Adventist School earlier at the Seventh Day Adventist School earlier that year. And at the school he was learning the alphabet and numbers. He was also learning to pray and thank God for everything. That evening when he returned home from school, Sebastian looked up at mother and father at the supper table. Let's pray, he said. Let's thank God. The family bowed their heads and closed their eyes and they thanked God for the food. Soon the family was praying before every meal. They also thanked God for everything that they had. Mother and father were very happy. They could see that Sebastian was a special boy who was blessed by God. When Sebastian was six years old, he asked his mother to take him to church on Sabbaths. Mother and father didn't want to take him to church on Saturday, but Sebastian had heard that about Sabbath school at his school and he wanted to go. <clears throat> he kept asking mother until she agreed to take him. But she did not go into the church. She waited outside the door until Sabbath school ended and then took Sebastian back home. Sebastian was happy to go to Sabbath school, but wanted mother and father to go to Sabbath school too. Uh, so he kept asking them until mother started going to Sabbath school with him. Father, however, would not go. Sebastian prayed that God, that father would go to church with them, and mother began to pray that father would go to church with them. Then Sebastian got a baby sister. Little baby Samantha was born into the family and father agreed to go to church for a special ceremony to dedicate little Samantha and Sebastian to God. Then when Sebastian was eight, mother decided to get baptized. A year later, Sebastian got baptized. He kept praying for father. He always asked father to go with him to church activities, especially the Pathfinders. He wanted his father to be closer to God. God answered Sebastian's prayers. When Sebastian was 10, uh, Father got baptized. Today, Sebastian is 12 and happy. Six-year-old Samantha also is happy, but Mother and Father are especially happy. They thank God every day for everything that they have, and especially for Sebastian, whom God sent to change their lives. And this 
is Sebastian. You got a good picture? Hold on. First, yeah. Winky. Winky, remember he's the one-eyed cat, doesn't have a right eye. Anyway, um, you want to take care of the issue down there. I think the cats are not behaving properly sometimes. Get on my other side. Could you come around? Anyway, this is our second time doing this because the first time that we had a problem with the video, which seems like maybe we're going to have another problem since our cameraman up there is <laughs> having her issues with her cat. Anyway, just to remind you of what happened before, how David had um, ended up in a cave with all his men, and it's the same cave that uh, Saul came into not knowing that they were there. David cut off part of the him of his robe and showed it to him later, you know, I could have killed you, my, in, my men urged me to kill you, <clears throat> but your God's anointed king and I will not touch you. That's not going to happen. So, anyway, um, no, after that we kind of close with the uh, Samuel dying and Israel gathered for his funeral. They buried him at his home in Ramah. And David moves south to the wilderness of Maon, which is really south of the Dead Sea, kind of an area that is very wilderness, very deserty. And um, I'm, sh I'm hoping that it's more desert, and more barren today than it was back then, because uh, it ends up <coughs> near the town of Carmel where there was a wealthy man living there and uh, he had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats and his, it was sheep shearing time. Now, the land as it looks right now would not support that many animals. So it had to have been a little less barren than it is today because today it's very barren. I've seen uh, videos from that area and it's Really, there's nothing there but rocks and dirt and sand. So, he ends up there, and then she, by sheep shearing time, this man, his name is Nabal, and his wife is Abigail. We are in 1 Samuel 25. 20, yeah, 25, by the way. So, if you're following along, sorry I forgot to remind you to get your Bibles. But uh, go ahead, if you haven't already, get your Bible so you can follow along. We're in 1 Samuel 25, and <clears throat> we're going to be down in um, verse, shoot, i got to get the new glasses, 3. <laughs> this man's name was Nabal, and his wife Abigail was a sensible and beautiful woman. Nabal, a descendant of Caleb, was crude and mean all his dealings. Now Caleb, we know, was not cool or mean. Caleb was one of the twelve uh, spies that Moses sent out, and he and Joshua were the only ones who came back and said, let's go, we can whoop these guys. Uh, when you look back at what the others said, they said, no, we're too little, they're giants, we're going to die if we try, we need to go back to Egypt, a bunch of wimps, they didn't trust their God, Caleb did, and well, he happens to be a descendant of Caleb, which is very unfortunate, because you're going to find out he's a not very nice guy. When David heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep, you know, he... He was a shepherd. He knows the process. You watch over them all this time, take care of them. Their wool grows out. You take them back to the barn. You shear them. Cut all this wool off. And then you celebrate. You have a big party, a big dinner, whatever you want to call it. And so he sent ten of his young men to Carmel with this message for Nabal. Peace and prosperity to you, your family, and everything you own. 
I have told that in the sheep shearing time, while your shepherds stayed among us near Carmel, we never harmed them and nothing was ever stolen from them. Ask your own men and they will tell you this is true. So, would you be kind to us since we have come at a time of celebration? Please share any provisions you might have on hand with us and with your friend David. David's young man gave this message to Nabal in David's name and they waited for a reply. Who is this fella David? Nabal sneered at the young man, which he's just being mean and cruel because everybody knew about David and about Saul. So, this, who does this son of Jesse think he is? There are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread and water and my meat that I've slaughtered for my shears and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where? So David's young man returned and told him what Nabal had said. Get your swords, was David's reply, so he strapped on his own. You remember what his sword was? When he was fleeing from Saul right away, he got from the high priest the sword that had been Goliath's sword. I'm sure it was a little big for him, but he had said at the time, there's nothing like this, so this was his sword. Then 400 men started off with David, and 200 remained behind to guard their equipment. You know, you've got enough stuff for all these 600 men. You've got to have a lot of stuff, and you've got to take care of it, especially out there in the wilderness, because you've got a lot of thieves running around trying to steal that stuff if they could. Meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. These men have been very good to us, and we never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time they were with us. In fact, day and night they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep. You need to know this and figure out what to do, for there's going to be trouble for your master and his whole family. He is so ill-tempered, no one can even talk to him. Well, in verse 18, you find Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wineskins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered, nearly a bushel of roasted grain, and 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 fig cakes. She packed them on donkeys and said to her servants, Go on ahead, I'll follow you shortly. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal what she was doing. As she was riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, kind of like a little valley between a couple of large hills there, <clears throat> she saw David and his men coming toward her. David was ju had just been saying, a lot of good it did to help this fellow. We protected his flock in the wilderness, and nothing he owned was lost or stolen. But he has repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man in his household is still alive tomorrow morning. Boy, that's that's pretty serious stuff. Obviously, he's like uh, I would have been, I think, uh, angry about what this guy has done, and he's not going to settle for just, well, that's too bad. It would have been nice if he had helped us. He's gone out there, and he, you know, I've got these warriors with me. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed low before him. I'm sure she got down on her knees, fell face down. She fell at his feet and said, I accept all blame in this matter, my lord. Please listen to what I have to say. I know Nabal is wicked and ill-tempered man. Please don't pay any attention to him. He's a fool, just as his name suggests. And when you look at it, you find out that the name Nabal means fool. But I never even saw the young men you sent. In other words, they went to the wrong person. They should have come to me instead of to Nabal. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, 
Since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let your enemies and those who try to harm you be as cursed as Nabal is. And here is a present that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with a long-lasting dynasty for you fighting the Lord's battles. And you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Even when you're chased by those who seek to kill you. See, she knew about Saul. You know Nabal knew about it too. Even when you're chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. When the Lord has done all he has promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Just don't leave yourself with the possibility of a guilty conscience later for something you did on the spur of the moment like that. It says, Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me, your servant. <clears throat> David replied to Abigail, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. For I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept me from hurting you, that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. Then David accepted her present and told her, Return home in peace. I have heard what you said. We will not kill your husband. When Abigail arrived home, she found that Nabal was throwing a big party and was celebrating like a king. He was very drunk, so she didn't tell him anything about her meeting with David until dawn the next morning. In the morning when Nabal was sober, and I'm sure hung over, <laughs> his wife told him what had happened. As a result, he had a stroke. The Bible actually says his heart failed him. And he lay paralyzed on his bed like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck him and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise the Lord who has avenged the insult I received from Nabal and has kept me from doing it myself. Nabal has received the punishment for his sin. Then David sent messengers to Abigail asking her to become his wife. When the messengers arrived at Carmel, they told Abigail, David has sent us to take you back to marry him. She bowed low to the ground and responded, I, your servant, would be happy to marry David. I would even be willing to become a slave, washing the feet of his servants. Quickly getting ready, she took along five of her servant girls as attendants, mounted on her donkey, and went with David's messengers. And so she became his wife. David also married Ahinoam from Jezreel, making both of them his wives. I remember he did have a wife, so here it mentions her. Saul, meanwhile, had given his daughter Michael, David's wife, to a man from Galam named Palti, son of Laish. Figured out David's gone. I'm going to try to kill him anyway, so you might as well marry somebody else. Ah. How much time? Uh, we just hit 19 minutes. We just hit 19 minutes. Well, I can do kind of an abbreviated version of the next chapter, I think. Um, it just barely has enough time. So, in the next chapter, in chapter 26, David spares Saul again. What's happening is um, men from Ziph, you know, go tell Saul... David's hiding in the hill of Hakalah, uh, which overlooks Jeshiam. Well, so Saul takes 3,000 elite troops with him. He goes down there, and he's camped along the road beside the hill of Hakalah near Jeshim, Jeshimon, where David was hiding. <clears throat> when David learned that Saul had come after him in the wilderness, he sent out spies to verify the report of uh, Saul's arrival. 
And he was there all right. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army, were sleeping inside of a ring formed by slumbering warriors. And Abner, the commander of his army, was actually a first cousin. His father was uh, Kish, and Abner's father was Ner. Kish and Ner were brothers. So, <clears throat> David goes back and he says, Who will volunteer to go in there with me? David asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai, son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother. I'll go with you, Abishai replied. <clears throat> so David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. Oh, God, I surely handed your enemy over to you, Abishai whispered to David. Let me pin him to the ground with one, one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike twice. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't either. No, David said, don't kill him. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord will strike Saul down some day, or he'll die of old age, or he'll die in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one who was anointed. But take his spear and that water jug beside his head. And then let's get out of here. So <clears throat> David took the spear and the jug of water that were near Saul's head. Then he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing them or even waking up because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. That's impressive. David climbed the hill opposite the camp. You can see God's taking care of him until he's at a safe distance. Then he shouted down to the soldiers and to Abner, son of Ner. Wake up, Abner! Uh, who is it? Abner demanded. Well, Abner, you're a great man, aren't you? David taunted. Where in all Israel is there anyone so mighty? So why haven't you guarded your master, the king, when someone came to kill him? This isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord that you and your men deserve to die because you failed to protect your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around. Where are the king's spear and jug of water that were beside his head? Saul recognized David's voice and called out, Is that you, my son David? David replied, Yes, my lord the king. Why are you chasing me? What have I done? What is my crime? But now, let my lord the king listen to his servant. If the lord has stirred you up against me, then let him accept my offering. But if this is simply a human scheme, then may those involved be cursed by the lord. For they have driven me from my home, so I can no longer live among the lord's people. And they have said, Go worship pagan gods. Must I die on foreign soil, far from the presence of the lord? Why has the king of Israel come out to search for a single flea? Why does he hunt me like a partridge on the mountains? Then Saul confessed, I have sinned. <clears throat> I think I've heard this story before. Come back home, my son. I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I've been a fool and very, very wrong. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Come on home. Everything will be fine, David. No problem. <clears throat> Here's your... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Here's your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal, and I refuse to kill you, even when the Lord placed you in my power. For you are the Lord's anointed. Now... May the Lord value my life, even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. And Saul said to David, Blessings on you, my son. You will do heroic deeds, and you will surely succeed. Then David went away, and Saul returned home. Ah, wow. So where are we on our time right now? 2436. We got a little bit of time, but I'm not going to do any more stories because we don't have that much time. But start reading if you want to read ahead in 1 Samuel 27. And I think we can go right on through to the end next week. Hopefully. Let's do it anyway. 
So 27, 28, 29, and 30. So these are what's coming up ahead for us. Anyway, <clears throat> just to remind you, there will be no, after next Sabbath, there will be no more Sabbath schools for a while. I will let you know. I will send a message to Ariane, Aliana, and Audric's mom. I will send a message to your mom, uh, Clementine and Charlie, to let them know. And if there's anyone else you know of that's watching, let us know who it is. I'd like to be able to greet them, and I'd like to be able to get word to them, you know, when things change for us. So, anyway, let's have a prayer before we wrap it up. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this story of David. How it shows us that even David could act as a normal person. He wasn't always so righteous and holy, and he'd do things I would have done. I would have gone wanting to make him pay for being so rude and things like that, but David was talked into being the kind of person we know he really was. We tend to be like that too sometimes, so help us remember the story of David when we're tempted to try to pay somebody back for something bad they've done. Help us to remember, let you take care of it. You take care of us, you also take care of our enemies. Thank you for all your promises to us and all the good things you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, see you next week. Bye-bye.